Hey, good afternoon. Welcome to Yes, You Are In The Right Place. This is the panel you've been waiting for. Opt in for the greater good. How far is too far? It's, it's sort of a conspiracy theory kind of thing. We thought that would be a nice way to wrap up the afternoon. Um, I'm Susan Marquis. I'm an academic. You can tell I have actual books, so therefore I must be one. Uh, Dean of the party ran graduate school at the Rand Corporation, which is a big freaking think tank. Uh, I'm also v vice president for innovation. I'm involved in this because, frankly, uh, I've been talking to Simon Lamb and some of the other organizers for a while, talking about technology implications for uh, the pandemic, how do we use it for good, and what are the risks? There's a lot to go on here. Um, my background, just a moment, Dean of the Party Ran Graduate School, recently wrote a book called I'm Not a Tractor about Florida farm workers. They've also written about special operations forces. But back in the day, I was actually a DJ at the original 930 Club, promoted a lot of the uh, straight edge hardcore punk bands, and uh, U2 opened for the band I managed, the Slicky Boys. So that's okay. It shows age, but it's sort of a cool age. I want to turn it over to the real cool cats. Um, Todd Richman, who's there in the orange, wave at us, Todd, zoom wave. So Todd is a is uh, the director of the Tech and Narrative Lab at uh, the school that we have here. He's a faculty member, but he came to us from the Institute for Creative Technology at USC. He started school as a music, music major, major back in the day and came back out the other end with a PhD in chemistry from Caltech. There's a bit of a story there that we won't dive into fully, but one of the important things Todd did was make the transition to technology. Um, as the internet was really coming into its own, Todd saw the possibility there, and it was all optimism. But in recent years, he thought, how do we go after technology, the applications and implications of technology in the public interest? How do we start bringing in the concerns of society as uh, technology has been led largely by the private sector? Harper Reed, there in green, give us a wave, Harper. Harper is a technology. He predicts the future for a living, which is a fairly modest statement, I think. <laughs> uh, uh, Harper, thanks for that. He um, was key in the Obama 2012 campaign, really doing breakthrough digital technology. We're going to talk about both the intended consequences of that and the unintended consequences in just a few minutes. He's the founder of a number of companies, uh, really pioneering crowdsourcing at threadless.com founding Modest uh, Inc., which then became involved with PayPal. So he's been in the cutting edge of the front of, um, of uh, technology and new uses of that for a long time. The connection here is uh, Todd's the director of the Tech and Narrative Lab, I think sort of MIT Media Lab for policy without some of the other issues. And uh, sorry, was that wrong? And uh, Harper's on our advisory group. So we've all, we're, we're uh, co-conspirators here. Guys, I want to open it up. Let's get this panel going and talk about the positive stuff. We're in the middle of a pandemic. That's not so positive, but we do have access to technology that we've never had before. And it makes this unprecedented time, a way, there's a way to mitigate this crisis. Let's talk about some of the, um, Harper, start with you. What are some of the real positive uh, aspects of technology here? Well, it's it's been an interesting time and, and I, my belief, and this kind of goes to, to my career in tech, is that tech is never the reason for the season, so to speak. Tech is always the augmenter. It's the thing that um, allows for um, organizations or what have you to get that extra step, that, that force multiplier. And I think what we've seen with this pandemic situation is that technology has been the force multiplier for a bunch of things. So, for instance, um, I, I mean, I've been on Zoom meetings for the last 40 days. I think it's just one Zoom meeting and I just hit pause every once in a while, but you know, things like that. Or um, I've played games with friends that are all over the world, over computer games, over video chat games. And, and I've made connections with people that I have, that I have not like talked to in years because suddenly everything is virtual. So this prioritization of virtual, of tech, really shows the distance some of our technical solutions have gone to make real in-person but virtual connections. And I think that's one of the, the things that I've seen that's been really positive. Um, 
I also think it's been really interesting to watch a lot of the various just news, um, the community organizations that are doing news around the pandemic to um, entertainment, a lot of really interesting things around that. But I do think what technology does is it amplifies, it augments. And so where we're seeing some weaknesses are places that we don't have a good coverage yet. But we're seeing the things that where tech covers, Zoom chats, for instance, be you know blown up and be huge. Um, and so I think that's where this is really interesting about seeing where tech has has gone. Rather than taking it to a hundred, it's now taking it to a thousand. All right, thanks, Todd. I want to talk to you. Uh, we've we talked about Harper's talked about tech uh, communications, about amplification, what tech brings in a broader sense. Can you talk, Todd? being the head of the Tech and Narrative Lab, about some of the specific ways we're using technology, uh, data in particular, mobile devices, uh, contact in, in identification, model spread, and the like. What do you, how are we using specific technologies? Uh, there are a number of ways, but I, I wanna just sort of amplify or augment one of Harper's points about the technology broadly. Um, what's interesting is that we were doing experiments with technology and teaching and training back in the late 90s using chat rooms and, uh, and then using uh, blogs and projection and, and back channel communication in the early 2000s. And in that case, it was always to augment the educational experience. And now that, tech, that technology has been thrust into replacing it by and large. And so I think it's been a really interesting experiment it validates those of us who were working in that area 10, 20 years ago, we knew what some of the shortcomings were and we were working on those. I think a lot of people who were removed from the technology, it was, if they weren't knee deep in it, they'd heard about it and they read about it, but they didn't really know. And so now it's, it's becoming painfully obvious to people who were not technology um, uh, sort of cognizant now they're in the midst of it and they're having to use it. And I think what's been amazing is how quickly schools and organizations have adapted to using Zoom and Teams and Skype. Um, these were tools that were nice to have and now all of a sudden they're the only thing that they have. So I think that broadly has been in some applicability. The other thing that we're seeing is, and this harkens back to my background when I used to mix potions and clone bacteria, science has really come to the forefront. Um, you know, for a for number of years, science has been uh, somewhat marginalized by the government and uh, I think by the public. Um, and now we're looking to it for one of the places that we're going to find solutions through vaccines, through understanding the disease. So the ability back from the day when I used to hand sequence DNA and expose um, X-ray sheets to read a sequence to now they can do it in a matter of hours that they're sequencing entire um, viral genomes. That aspect of the technology, the biotechnology has been, been amazing. And then the data that we're collecting, you know, the, the same tools that have made these large tech giants as large as they are and as rich as they are, those same capabilities to collect data and information uh, on people can be used for the greater good to try and understand outbreaks, to contain outbreaks, and to try and lead to, great, to uh, better public health outcomes. So I think that's where we're really looking around the corner to see, can we take all these things that we've evolved to make big companies money and use them for a public health good? All right. So you guys have been far more up with people than knowing you both personally. I'm kind of surprised. That's not so good. We're seeing all this positive use of technology. I'm going to talk about the specifics for just a moment and then do a follow-up. I mean, so we're seeing tech being used, and Todd, you were referencing uh, the data that have made these companies uh, rich. We're now using those data in a public health sense. So we're using mobile phone and other device data to track compliance with physical distancing. We're using... Um, uh, looking at using technology for contact identification, the Apple Google partnership, and this, which we'll come back to in just a moment, but this idea that your phone would know if you had been within six feet of someone and it provide a way to notify them. We're using, we're seeing hardcore tech in very sophisticated models. Uh, Rand just put one out yesterday that allows you to look at the, um, 
the public health and the economic implications of various policies you might put in place, looking at the trade-off between um, uh, these competing public interests. So we're using very sophisticated modeling, which is only possible now through machine learning and some of the big data uh, capabilities that we have. We're, we're looking at health screenings as you walk in the buildings. The fact, and I know this came up in uh, one of the billboard articles just recently this past week of using uh, these health screenings as a way to allow people to come back to live events. That's all great. So what are we missing here? Why isn't this just a good news story, Harper? Well, I, I think... <laughs> I like how you teed me up. Real quick, first, we, I have to acknowledge that this is the first up with people reference that I've heard in maybe <laughs> 15 years. And I love it. This is my, that was my favorite thing that happened today. So um, I think the, 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 the tricky part about this is we live in a world where we are all just um, exhausting data. Like every move we make, data is being pushed out from us. So right now I'm using Zoom on my computer. Zoom is collecting various data about how I'm using it, probably how big the window is. Did I open up this chat window? Did I open up the attendee list? All this various data. And they're using that data typically for doing business to make more money. And so if we look at some of the kind of tech that has been built to respond to this crisis, um, there's examples of organizations that have privacy policies um, that are just not in line with public health. So for instance, um, there was a, there was a, 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 I think a Buzzfeed article recently about a uh, public health initiative, I think in Portland, um, where they were doing a symptom checker. Um, but the people who built the, the pub, the, the symptom checker uh, said in their privacy policy that they would de-anonymize the data, that they would sell it to marketing companies, um, and that they would use this as a revenue stream. Mm -hmm. Now, in the article, the person, you know, the people responsible for that said, oh, well, this is just our generic privacy policy, et cetera. But I don't, I'm a consumer. I'm a pretty savvy consumer. I don't read the privacy policy. I don't know what's, what the liabilities are with using these things. And I think that's normal behavior. And this is just one example of where the world that we had before, I think, is not driving well with the world we have now. Whereas before, when we, when we used something, we kind of had this idea. Well, when I pull up my phone and I install this new app, um, you know, this app, you know, House Party or whatever, very cool app, really fun. I'm using it to talk with my friends, um, but it's not essential. And so when we saw that it was trading data for marketing or data for whatever, we were like, okay, whatever, I'm using this. But now some of these apps have moved into essential where this is the only way I get to interact with my family, my friends. This is the only way I get to interact with my community, my neighbors, whatever it might be. And suddenly we're seeing people that are parlaying that kind of um, or this crisis to marketing opportunities, data collection opportunities. Um, and, and it's pretty scary. Um, early on in the crisis, I was doing some work around um, lockdown, lockdown compliance visualization. Mm -hmm. um, that's a pretty mouthy way of just saying we were making some maps that, sh that would show if people were leaving their houses a lot. And we were doing this with carrier data that was available from marketing partners. So these marketing companies had carrier level data that showed where each of us, where each of us was moving to just normal, like location data, just showing where each of us were at this point in time. Um, and the granularity was maybe a couple days or a week, but still it showed where we were, like where your location was. And we have this assumption that when we have these devices and we turn off location data that people can't tell where we are. Well, the thing is, is that the carriers, these big companies, they still are able to see where we are, which means that they're still tracking us, which means that they're still selling this data. And that was, I think, problematic before. But I think now we just have to be very, I don't know, thoughtful about how we're using data, what it's being used for. And the question, as Todd mentioned, like the, the public health requirements. I mean, there's some great public health opportunities with this data, but we have to make sure that we don't accidentally um, or just, I guess, fall into the world that where we live now, where the most vulnerable people become more vulnerable. Well, so, all right, picking up on this, let me, I'm going to turn to you, Todd, because I just want to, if you could pick up on what Harper just said, um, you know, what is the risk of this? We should be, it shouldn't this be like vaccinations that we should be willing, you know, it's not a choice of opting in or not. If we can get these data, we can track compliance, we can uh, do contact tracing. 
Todd, why is that not the, the immediate right answer? What are you seeing here in the ethical issues? Here? Well, so there's, there's a lot of them. Um, I, you know, I think Harper, Harper touched on the point that these technologies that were once a nice to have have now become essential. And he talked about, you know, communication tools and platforms that are needed so that I can interact with my family and my friends. We're looking at a future where I may need to have an app that certifies that I'm immune, that I have antibodies to the virus so that I have access to public services. So I will not be able to get on public transportation unless my phone has the green icon on it. And other countries are already doing this. South Korea um, has apps that, that do this type of, um, uh, of, of tracking so an individual can show what their status is. So you're, you're talking about having apps not only being necessary for you to communicate, but for you to just do your daily work. To, to move around. I mean, all of the things that we take completely for granted in the United States of being able to freely move from my house to the store to work and back, those have already been um, restricted by a lot of the orders, but then they may be enforced by the digital technologies that we will not be able to do that. The other issue that you have is that for the Apple Google platform, about 2.5 billion people around the world will not be able to use that platform because their, phone, their phones, they either don't have smartphones or their smartphones don't have new enough Bluetooth capabilities for it to work with their APIs. Um, if you look at the populations that traditionally don't have expensive smartphones, they tend to be lower income and they tend to be older populations. And these are the most at-risk populations. So in some sense, we're creating a digital solution that is serving those that are least at risk. And that's kind of counter to the way that public health is supposed to work. You're supposed to be serving the people who are most at risk. So classic contact tracing has been done by human beings who go out just like census workers do. They go out and they pound the pavement and they meet with people face to face and you have an analog relationship. And that's based on the fact that a person has to be somewhere at some time, right? We all occupy a place. And I think the challenge with digital and the things that scares me the most is that digital does not obey time and space rules. Digital, you can copy it an infinite number of times. You can fake it an infinite number of times. It persists beyond your life. Um, and it, create, it can create a past that you actually didn't have. So the, the ability to not only collect all of this incredibly granular data, then potentially fake that data or have that data stolen by individuals or by nation states and then used for uh, any number of sort of um, purposes, that's all should be very terrifying. And we need to be thinking about how we're going to try and cut down on the risks from those things. Nothing is completely safe. I mean, life is not completely safe, but there we can go into thinking about the way that we collect, store and use data in ways that are thoughtful and in ways that are reckless. And I think that in the case of a pandemic where time is of the essence, we tend towards being reckless. And that, has, that will have much longer infinite implications if we screw it up now. So uh, Harper, one of the things that's come up is this idea, um, not just private industry having these data and monetizing these data in some way, but the idea that the data we're collecting about uh, mobility data, contract tracing and the like, that it, there's actual geopolitical concerns here that they, these data can be weaponized. Harper, do you want to pick up on that at all? Yeah, and it's not, I think it's not just about weaponized. It's also, it's just that it can be used in such different ways that we're not intending it to. I think that's the main thing. It's, it's weaponized is one option of that. But one thing that I have been paying a lot of attention to is as we have like, or, or let's unpack it a little bit more. When you do a traditional contact tracing exercise, and for those of you who, who are, we keep saying this, but we forgot to kind of define it. For those of you who aren't familiar, this is how you go in and you, you kind of talk to people and you get an understanding of have they exposed others? Who did they expose? 
Where did they get the virus? Um, and this allows our epidemiologists and our public health people to start modeling and get an idea of how things have spread and then how they need to, like, for instance, stock up on masks and whatnot for a hospital or how do they need to respond to a community. Um, but in this, in this thing, there's a lot of data that's collected. Um, but the, the exciting thing is typically, or, or I should say traditionally in the past for other epidemics, this delayed data, it falls under public health data um, or HIPAA data, which in both cases have very specific ways you store it, very specific ways it can be accessed, and more importantly, very specific ways it can be used by a government. Um, a lot of these laws were established in the HIV and AIDS epidemics. They were established in places where privacy was important. Um, and so they've done a reasonable job, I wouldn't say a great job, but a reasonable job of establishing um, process for contact tracing data. Now, when you talk about automated collection of data, like with these fancy devices we all have, that's kind of thrown out the window because it's not public health data until the moment you start talking to public health people. And it's sometimes it's centrally stored. And so then you start getting in these situations where, you know, what happens if a government agency is hacked and all this data is spread out somewhere? Um, this has happened in the past, in the past five years, this has happened a couple times. What happens if um, some company buys the, the vendor that, it, that owns this data and then it's used in a very different way? This has happened before. I mean, there's a great example of this, which, which is LiveJournal, which probably a lot of us remember LiveJournal as this host of community, um, specifically a very, really good place for the gay and lesbian community, really powerful place, a lot of great writing. Um, it was bought by a Russian company that wasn't friendly and, did, and Russia at that point didn't have policy that was friendly towards gay and lesbian people. Um, and so that is just the reality, the geopolitical reality um, running right into this delay data that we thought was safe and stored in a good place. And so I think there's very real examples of what happens when we're not deliberate and thoughtful about where data is stored and how it is stored. Um, and as Todd said, right now we are running without thought for risk. We're thinking about what are the solutions that we can do to get us out of this pandemic. And every one of us is hurting in one way or the other. Um, you know, reopening the economy is the number one thing. But we have to make sure that we don't sacrifice our civil liberties, um, we don't sacrifice our human rights, et cetera, to get to that end. Um, and I think a lot about this. I'm in a very privileged position. I'm in a beautiful basement. Uh, I'm in Chicago. Everything is pretty good. I have food, et cetera. But, but I can step outside of my house and walk a couple blocks and see people who are not in such a good spot. I can look at my neighbors who are not in such a good spot. And I have to make sure that when we're thinking about data, that we're not just thinking about me, you know, a pretty well-to-do white dude. We're thinking about all those folks that are vulnerable, all the folks that are out there. And I think what Todd said is really important, and we should reiterate this, which is the people who are most at risk for COVID-19 are oftentimes the people that are left out of the tech solutions that we think will reopen the economy for COVID-19. Um, and that really scares me because that, what that means is that, and, 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 and I think you said weaponized, Susan, which I think is such a good word, but I think the scary thing is that we are, we are building a weapon that only hurts the people that are already being hurt. We don't even know it's a weapon. We're just building this thing that, that we think is going to help us go to restaurants again or play at a show again or for me do a gig again. And, and I think that, that that's good for us, for me, but it's not going to help, you know, the grandparents. It's not going to help the people who have comorbidities. It's not going to help all those people that really need help, and especially those vulnerable communities in our cities and states. Well, I think you bring up a really important point here, Harper. And I, Todd, thank you for, for introducing that idea. Um, this idea that the pandemic, it's, it doesn't get into tech directly, but it's uh, we have one more unintended consequence of pursuing technical, uh, technological solutions, that we're only increasing the disparities that we see in this country and that we see around the world. The very people who are most vulnerable are the ones who will be excluded. The very ones who are most vulnerable are the ones who will not be able to work. And the very ones who are most vulnerable are the ones who've often lost their jobs or are doing what we've called critical jobs that are often the lowest paid job, the farm workers in Florida, the grocery or, store clerks. Or they're the most at risk. And, and therefore most at risk, right? 
So exactly. I want to, um, you're, you're picking up on some key points here, this idea of competing public interests. And, and Todd and Harper, both of you got involved with the Tech and Narrative Lab, Todd as the founding director and, and Harper on, on this advisory group, to bring that public interest piece into the tech world so that it's not that the companies are necessarily evil. It's just, it's not been their job, even as though they are effectively making policy, but it's not their job to consider societal concerns, the, not just the applications, but the implications of technology for our communities. Todd, do you want to pick up on that a bit more in terms of what we're seeing in this crisis? Well, yeah. So th- th- I hear a lot of my friends, uh, friends and acquaintances talking about, I can't wait until we get back to normal. And my response to them is not, they don't particularly like it, (laughs) uh, but my response is that that normal is gone and it's not coming back because in fact, that wasn't normal. Um, You can, and and I think that we were living, and, and this is, there were a lot of things happening both with diseases, with antibiotic resistance with with viral with um, with uh, zoonotic uh, transmission uh, for viruses jumping from species, those issues, and then all of the technology adoption has really been happening under the hood, mm-hmm. and we've kind of been oblivious to it. And this is, you know, I kind of I've seen some memes around this that this is kind of Mother Nature sort of reminding us, you know, it's like, oh, I don't have time to think, you know, to think about science and I don't have, well, Mother Nature says, well, you're going to take the time. So, uh, you know, we, what we really have right now is we have to think about what will the new normal be and is it going to be more equitable than it was before? And I don't hear enough of those conversations. What I hear is we want to go back to normal and that means that we, if, if you adopt that, then you're going to go back to the same inequities that we had and the same problems that we have. And we're going to be back in the exact same place than we are now, right? So we, people, I've seen some language around America 2.0. And I think the challenge is, okay, if we're rebooting the country and we really are thinking about what does now a normal day-to-day life look like given these constraints, how do we do that in a way that is not driven by interests that are not at, uh, that are not really about the public? And, and this is getting to your the point that you originally asked me about, which is I, we don't fault the the companies for making money. That's what companies are supposed to do. They're supposed to innovate. They're supposed to make money, but they've been making policy because the government's been absent, and the government doesn't understand because we have a bunch of older, uh, at the risk of generalizing, older white guys than me who really are technologically incompetent. And so- Or or whiter than you, Todd. uh, I'd like to say it's both. (laughs) As a bass player, I'd like to think that it's both. Um, So really what we need to do is think completely differently about how we make policy in this world. And the technology companies have to be working in concert with the public good and with the non-government organizations and with the government and the policy analysts, instead of just going off and building stuff and then unleashing it and saying, oh, well, it's up to society to figure out what the rules are. It's like, no, we can't do that. We also can't have the draconian government comes in and puts their thumb on everything because we know that that will not work either because other countries are out there innovating without the same moral and ethical frameworks that we have. So this is another balance point that we have is how do we move forward and be innovative when we know that we have competitors in the world who are doing so and not playing by the same rules that we are. And that's, that's a whole other tricky one. And Harper, I'd love to hear your thoughts on that. Oh man, that's a hard one. I, so I've been tracking, um, COVID-19 since mid-Jan when we were clued into some stuff that was happening in Wuhan and have been doing full-time work around COVID-19 and the tech response um, since mid-February. And part of this, because we started so early, is most of the work that we were doing in the beginning was, was watching what other countries were 
were responding with, what, what was happening outside the U.S. And then seeing what was happening inside the U.S., um, there's a couple really interesting things. The first thing is, is that the U.S. is really big. I think we forget this. It's really big. We don't have a strong federal government right now for whatever reason. Um, but, more, but what that means is that we have a lot. We have 50 governance, governments that have to make 50 different decisions and hopefully integrate with one another. Um, and this is just creating a very um, different response than a lot of these, you know, places that we look to who are successful. Um, you know, so if you look to a place like Taiwan, who's done a very good job of responding to this, um, there's drastically different laws. They have a drastically smaller population. Um, it's more like the state of New York than it is like anything else we can compare it to. Um, and so it's very difficult for us to find some equality with the comparisons. Um, mm -hmm. But what I am scared of, and I've heard this over and over again from some advisors of my own, is that um, one thing COVID-19 is doing, and this, we're seeing this on the tech stuff already, is moving our various communities, our various countries, et cetera, towards a more nationalistic or inward looking perspective. And so you're seeing things, well, this is the solution that only works for X locale. Um, and we're seeing that in the states as well. Like this is like, this is a solution for this state, or I don't want to go to that state because the governor isn't as, doesn't have a strong understanding of whatever. Um, a lot of this is carried by our news coverage. It's not, you know, it's not necessarily based in policy. It's just um, our assumptions. Um, and this, I think, is setting us up for a very complicated new world. Um, and to echo your point, Todd, I don't think we can unring this bell. We're not going to go back to the old world. We now have to deal with what this actually means. What happens? Like how do, so, so for the last five years, I've been speaking in, at conferences and that's been my primary revenue source, which means flying to a lot of different countries. Like how do I safely, let's say they open up, how do I safely fly to that country? Do I quarantine for 14 days before the gig? Like, how do I schedule a tour? Like, all these questions are really big questions that we could solve with technology if we work together, if we integrate together, if we make sure that we have interoperability. Susan? Yeah, so I'm going to pick up on that because this is the AMP Music Summit. So this idea of how do we get back to um, – there's several – there's the big picture, the competing – uh, public interest, right? So you have privacy, you have public health, but you have the economy that people need to work for a living. People need to um, actually have commerce. And in the music side of things, you've obviously, touring has become a major source of revenue. It shifted over time, but increasingly touring is a major source of revenue. Um, Simon Lamb, who's one of the organizers of this, was uh, has been deeply involved in festivals, but, uh, particularly uh, EDM-type festivals. Um, I know from your Twitter feed, Harper, that people ignoring mask requirements kind of freak you out. So what are yeah. you seeing? What are some ideas? And then I'm going to turn over to Todd because you do a lot of live music. But starting with Harper, um, what are some of the things we might do to start getting music venues, clubs, and the like uh, uh, starting to operate again, live music to come back? So I think there's a lot of potential solutions. We just saw in the chat that Chris Thompson suggested something. We already have, you know, screening for ages, license, you know, metal, dangerous stuff and whatnot for, for shows. And like, could you extend that to, to include new, you know, and various other ways to screen? Um, and we're seeing a huge industry popping up from a lot of our biggest companies and a lot of startups around um, health passports or immunity passports. For, for exactly this, to be able to say, you know, are, you know, you could imagine a world where you go to a show and they're screaming, they're screening for temperature with one of the temperature guns or whatnot. And we've also seen this in China and a few other places where this is, where this is happening. I think the complicated thing goes to what Todd was saying in the beginning, which is if we don't mind, if we don't mind excluding all of the people who can't afford on a device, all the people who are not covered by those devices, if we don't mind excluding those people, then we could probably do something very quickly. But the, but the trick is, is um, 
Inclusion. The trick is making sure that a, a techno solution, well, not techno, I wish it was techno. We could all go to the Bergheim or whatever, but a technology solution that solves these kind of problems um, is rife with really complicated ethical problems. And, um, you know, like Todd commented in, in, the, in the group chat, like forgery is a huge issue. What is the liability? Like I have had friends that, you know, when back in the day that we used to go to clubs and they used to use a fake ID. But what happens if that fake ID or your app that's hacked allows you to go into a club when you shouldn't be and you infect folks? But I think there's some other chilling effects as well that are, that are really complicated, which is in our networked world, we have these devices. And one of the things that Apple and Google are suggesting is that we should use exposure alerting to alert you if you've been exposed. But well, what happens when that, the trigger of being alerted if you're exposed means that you're supposed to quarantine yourself and isolate for 14 days? Great, that's good for me. Um, but what happens if you can't afford to isolate for 14 days? What happens if you participating in that means that you've also exposed your community, your church, your friends, you know, other artists, whatever it might be, your community. Um, and what's scary is participating in some of these programs may put your entire community at risk if we're not careful with how those these programs are working, which means that people are going to be compelled not to participate. They're going to be compelled not to participate in this stuff, which then means that it hurts our public health institutions because they're going to not trust them. They're not going to participate in the thing that will actually get us out, which is contact tracing, et cetera. So I think these things are all linked together. And so we have to have a very deliberate answer of, and 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 it's and I'm kind of laughing because I realize that I'm basically saying we have to be careful about letting people into shows because eventually they're not going to trust public health people and everything's going to fall apart. Which I think there is not. It's not a tenuous link. Like we have to be deliberate about this stuff because if we don't, the chilling effects could be really really big. And that's one of the things I worry about is how do we how do we just be thoughtful? And us tech people typically we're not thoughtful. We're thoughtful about money. We're we move fast and break things. We move fast and break things. And I think that, that this is not a time when I want to break things because when I break things, it's my community. Yeah. And, well, and I think... I, oh, I was going to say, Todd, you're an active musician. You're playing out regularly. Uh, with I was. And several others. But, um, uh, you know, what are you seeing as an, a, a musician who not just earns revenue from playing out, but actually that's part of your life and part of who you are. What is possible to help us to bring some live music back? Well, so the, the first thing we have to do is we, we have to defy the laws of physics and get rid of latency because then we could perform live across the world and we'd all be good. Unfortunately, physics is a thing. So I, I view this as an opportunity for artists, and I consider myself and my wife is a sculptor, and she's having to to wrangle with this. Uh, she had a show at the Venice Biennale. It's supposed to go to, it actually has already shipped to a museum in Hong Kong. She was supposed to go install it for a show later this summer. It's already been postponed once. She's probably gonna have to do a remote uh, installation because she would have to quarantine for 14 days and all that. So Harper, my wife shares your pain on this whole, how do you tour and how do you wrangle the art? She's having to re also rethink how you teach sculpture it, when you've all you've got is Zoom, you know, I, I think that this pandemic one one thing is this will finally be the killer app for virtual reality, because now there is a true impetus to nail the nail immersion for healthcare, for entertainment, for interaction. So Facebook's three billion dollar investment in Oculus may finally start to pay some some dividends, although there still are a bunch of experience and technical issues to, that they have to solve. But this is, this will be a driver. I think this will, we'll look back 10 years from now and say COVID-19 was actually a tipping point for, for VR. The other thing is it's a, it's an opportunity for us to rethink what it means to perform and what it thing, what it means to create um, and collaborate. Um, you know, it, it, People will, the older musicians around will lament the, the death of the studio scene in Los Angeles and New York, you know, that saw its heyday through the 60s and 70s. 
And I always consider that kind of an anomaly because before then musicians got paid for playing live, usually not very well. And if you go back further, the, the musicians were supported by patrons, by, by wealthy patrons. So in some ways, the, you know, the, the 60s and 70s was the anomaly and we've moved back into the sort of new normal of what it means to be a musician. But I think you're seeing some creative use of um, recording and phone and people recording scratch tracks and then sending that to band members and then recording their parts and bringing them together. I think you're seeing people do live streaming on YouTube and interacting very intimately, actually. I mean, they're literally performing in their pajamas from their bedrooms. That, so it's, you know, it's the old saying, when God closes a door, he opens a window, right? So we've lost this ability to go to a club and play music and perform in the way that we did before. But now, if you give me constraints, that means that I can use my creativity to come up with new ways to engage with people, new ways to collaborate with my artists and, and make, make art. Because if we're not making art, then it doesn't matter, right? Nisha said, without music, why bother? Can I, can I jump in here? I, I think there's this other thing that we forget about. We have to remember how bad technology was five years ago or 10 years ago and how quickly it changes. Um, I contend that Zoom is the MySpace of video chat. And if we think of all the cool stuff that has happened since MySpace, there's so much opportunities to, to, to move forward with live performance, to figure out what is the hack on latency? Like, what is the hack? Like, how do we start Todd early so that I can play with Todd? Like, what is the hack? And, and I have friends who are doing this and they're experimenting. And, and um, I've been to so many, you know, DJ or electronic based concerts or dance parties on Zoom. Um, you know, my, my complaint is it's hard to hook it to my stereo, but, but I'm not, but I'm not the, the performer. But I think it really is for me, it's like, what is the hack? And realizing that we can really modify the tech, I think is we're in control of the tech, I guess, is the important thing. We can do it. So, so there's a question that's come up uh, in chat from Bob Johnston, and he's talking about this idea of virtual broadcast events that are actually sort of market by market as opposed to these large national events. Um, yeah, so Todd, you've started to go after that. What is, what is the venue? What are you thinking? Well, so it's interesting because I, a colleague of mine at, at Institute for Creative Technologies 20 years ago was uh, looking at reverb algorithms and what he did was he, he would go to concert halls around Europe and sample them. And then he could, through software, simulate any concert hall in the world, right? So this idea of a venue, you have to think about what, what really, why are people going to concerts? You know, they're, they're going to hear music. They're going to interact with their friends. They're going to be in a place to be immersed in something some of those things we can actually replicate right now virtually very well. And in fact, it's better because you don't have to deal with parking and you don't have to deal with the person spilling the beer on you. And so there, there are all of these potential upsides, but it really, to me, it's more of a recalibration, both on the heart of the artists and on the, on, on the part of the people who are going to attend on what it means to attend something. I mean, this is, we really have to, and our work, when we were working in virtual reality, we talked a lot about this. If we nail virtual reality, it really will force us to rethink what it means to be human because we start to blur the lines between a human analog to analog, you know, relationship and our relationship with the virtual. So this is, we're getting pushed into this kicking and screaming right now in the creative side, which is what does it mean to be a musician? What is a venue? What constitutes a venue? What pieces of that are important to people and what pieces are not? And, and, and it really, we have to be flexible because I come back to this, you know, this idea that I want things to get back to normal. It's like, no, let's build the new normal. Well, so that's right, our only so choice. The, this this idea of uh, new normal, I want to pick up on Ravi's question here. Harper, can I ask you um, to talk just 
a quick reaction, just a quick reaction to what's one entrepreneurial endeavor that's most impressed you already in just a few weeks into this crisis? Oh, man. <clears throat> one of the things that I, I just saw, I just talked to a really great entrepreneur here in Chicago, and um, their work was all done with um, basically after school programs. So it wasn't really in entertainment or wasn't really in hard, hard tech. But what it was is it was a thing where they were creating after school programs. And obviously schools, there's no, school isn't the same. Um, but so they have a list of, you know, a couple hundred teens who used to be very well occupied by these really great social kind of experience after, after school programs. Um, and they're just kind of lost. And so what he realized is that, that everything now is a two-sided marketplace. The hospitals are looking at, for people to do senior check-ins just to make sure that people are doing okay. Make sure people have food, make sure people are, you know, have their medicine, et cetera, get got groceries, et cetera. And this guy was like, oh, well, I got all these, I got all these seniors in high school that could now check in on all these seniors who are looking for, um, you know, help. Um, and so it's like really acknowledging and finding those two, two sided marketplaces, which um, I think they're all over. I just saw one today. We were talking about it in this, in this Zoom meeting. Um, I think it's called spresence.com. And what it does is it takes artists. Um, who want to um, pop into, like, we can hire an artist to pop into our Zoom chat and do some, you know, a quick little performance to start the meeting or as a break or what have you. And it's, it's just a way to get some money to some folks who are needing it right now. So I think there's, it's really about trying to, to understand where is there a need and realizing that needs have changed all over. Like the needs that we had four months ago are different than the needs we have now. And then the second is, where is the audience? Um, you know, who is that audience for? Is it for Zoom chatters? Is it for people who are like, you know, Instagram shoppers or Instacart shoppers rather? I'm more of an Instagram shopper, but an <laughs> Instacart shopper. Um, you know, what, who are these, who is the audience? And then like, what are we connecting them with? And I think that's pretty, um, pretty interesting. I want to hear more about Weed Rave though. Did you see that question? That's a good one. Yeah. I know. So we're going to be following up on the weed rave thing, I guess, here. But I will. So I'm going to use the weed rave question uh, to actually, uh, Todd, I'm going to have you, we're, we're going to have one last piece here. Todd, um, what can we do? What, what are your thoughts about something positive coming out of this, a way we can leverage tech to bring the community together to perhaps go after some of these disparities? Um, I don't want to overplay the silver lining piece of a pandemic, but we are seeing uh, some positive things that we can take away and continue into this new normal. So I, I think for me, and I've struggled with this. I mean, I when this first hit and we sheltered in place, I, I actually didn't pick up my instrument for probably about a week or two. And I'm somebody who typically at least an hour a day, I'm, I'm working on things. Part of it was because all my gigs had gotten canceled. So there was, but, but there was something more psychological happening. And I think I, I've circled back around and I've, and part of it is I've, I've just taken stock of what I want to be doing musically mm. and what I can do musically and what tools are at my disposal and what capabilities are out there and then marrying those things together. So I've got, I've already, I've always experimented with looping and some other things on bass. So I've, I've got another piece of technology that's coming and I've, I've figured out how I'm going to integrate it with something. And so I think it really is, we have amazing tools right now. You can record entire albums on your phone. You can create uh, films on your phone we should be creating things and you have to keep your practice going. And it's important to just, you need to adapt your practice. And so don't think about the things that you can't do right now, artistically, think about the things that you can do artistically and think about the things that are going to feed you um, emotionally and, and mentally fans. and feed the community. Right. Yeah. And, and I think, but I think those two will come, right. If you figure out how, to do something that feeds you, that's what people pick up on and that will start to then generate uh, goodwill and, and make things happen. All right, I'm getting uh, the word that we need to be wrapping up here. Um, thank you, Todd. Thank you, Harper. Thank, thank you to the organizers of the AMP Music Summit inviting us to be here. We're delighted. We're now gonna do the Zoom wave and head out. So thanks guys. 
See ya. Bye. Bye.